Okay. Hey guys, uh, I'm very happy and proud that I have Professor Gunnar Rosnova with us on this, on this uh, I think is the number six live. We, uh, as we already know, uh, you already have the next live, which will be uh, Alexei. He'll be talking about, uh, about the virtual human. And uh, I'm very honored to meet to, to have her here because she, uh, since I started to make this live, she's the first person that I do not know like closely. And she was very friendly, friendly when I invited her. So now I'm going to make some quick announcements so you can know, can be aware, uh, aware of what happened. So as always, you know, I'm always experimenting on the channel. I'm always trying new think, new way of improve your experience. So whenever you do a question now, we are going to have the question on, your, on the video. So it means that your contribution will be covered on stone. So now whenever you make a question, you'll be there. You, you, you are free to use the question if you have a YouTube channel, so on. You can just use the question in your channel. I think that's a very nice way that you can, uh, can grow together. Uh, regarding the question, I talked to Professor Gana Rosnova. She agreed that you, if you have a question, you can ask. And if you want to stop, or if the question is a little bit more generic, we are going to treat them by the end of the, of the talk. I'm going to talk very briefly about Professor Gana. Uh, you have a link to her social network. Uh, you have a link to her LinkedIn page. I believe I could stay like hours talking about her achievements. So, Professor Gunn is from the Department of Epidemiology, and uh, she is assistant professor. Uh, very, very briefly, she is from the University, uh, the University Medical Center Utrecht. I don't know how to speak that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she, she, uh, she built a team of international and of, of collaboration on the interdisciplinary research uh, on the interface of modern epidemiology and data analysis. I guess it's about data science. I also invite some people from data science. I don't know if you'll be, they'll be here. Uh, uh, and she has a lot of achievement, but she, uh, one thing that's interesting that uh, she's mentioned uh, two masters of science and one PhD on biostatistics. Uh, I'm thinking I'll invite the Professor Macedo. He's from, bio, from Italy, from biostatistics. We work together in a, in a group called Business Group. Uh, we like the chair and co-chair and so on. She has, uh, her research is concentrated on epidemiology. And she already has a very nice video here. So you can double check her video. I will make sure to leave in the description. She has a very short video teaching how to use the SIR model. Uh, recently, I posted to you two talks called the Curious George. It's a very, it's a joke to the monkey uh, of, the, of the cartoon. So essentially I was like, asking questions on the event in Brazil. The event was all about COVID. So now you have another opportunity to talk about COVID. That's a very important topic. So one of the reasons I invite her because I met her on a talk. I, I, loved, I liked a lot her talk. Uh, Professor Armando Neves, which, uh, he has a talk here as well. And he said a very nice word about her talk. So she was quite friendly. She answered, she answered the question very friendly. I, was, I, I thought to myself, wow, I have to invite her to, to come to my channel. She was very fast to accept. I guess she agreed with my initiative of bringing my biomathematics to everyone, but in, in the right way, like expert coming here and talk to you, not just about someone talking talk randomly about biomathematics. She just published a paper, very important paper, it's on the description of the video. So uh, I'm testing everything. So I, I guess I, now I can ask Professor Gana to start. Please, Professor Gana. Um, Yes, I will start. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, um, hello, Georgia. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I think it's uh, very nice to be here. I must say that I'm not very experienced with uh, doing like uh, really talks during live streaming events. So I hope that uh, uh, I will do everything well. Um, I would also like uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, during my talk, we agreed with Georgia that uh, you can uh, ask uh, questions, so you can put uh, comments um, on my talk and ask questions, and uh, Georgia will be checking uh, if there are any questions or not, and he will stop me during the talk so that I can uh, reply in the most appropriate moment. And if um, eventually, yeah, if we can't manage time or if there are no questions, then the questions will, all, all the rest of the questions can be asked at the end of my talk. And um, um, I would like uh, to, well, share first my slides. Or, uh, I will go in full screen mode, so I won't be able to see anybody but only my slides. 
so, so Professor Gana, just to let you know, I'll be, I'll, I'll leave the, 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 the video, but I'll be in background listening to you. So just any problem, I'll be here to help you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let me see. View on the full screen. And then, and then it's again. Okay, so I think you can see now um, my slides. So uh, once again, as Georges said, that um, I, um, I have I, my talk will be about the um, modeling the COVID pandemic, and uh, this uh, I have been quite um, involved in the modeling of the COVID pandemic and in advising uh, the governments and uh, two countries or working quite closely with the policymakers in two countries. And these are the Netherlands and uh, Portugal. And there will be two different topics that I will address. And um, uh, well, I prepared the slide, but of course, Georgia made a very nice introduction for me. So I'm an assistant professor in um, the University Medical Center Utrecht in the Netherlands. And uh, originally, uh, I did my studies in my PhD in Portugal, and I still I'm still affiliated researcher in the BOIC. It's uh, Biosystems and the Integrative Sciences uh, Institute, and this is the second um, uh, institute with whom I have been uh, uh, working. Uh, the second institute with whom I have been working on the uh, COVID research, and um, well, I will present this work. But of course, this work wouldn't be possible without also involvement of a lot of people. And here I uh, have the photos of all my collaborators in the past year and a half on um, on COVID. And uh, so there are people, these are the people mainly, the researchers uh, from Lisbon and from Utrecht. And uh, most importantly on this team, we have uh, two people who are uh, advising the government. So Manuel Gomes, he's uh, the member of uh, the COVID-19 vaccination committee in Portugal. And he is one of the main experts who has been, who, who has become almost a media figure. And, um, uh, so we could uh, actually uh, deliver like, the results of our research uh, via collaboration with him. And there is also other people like Mark Bonten and Patricia, and they work with the uh, Dutch government. And they were the ones also uh, who helped to promote our research and make it useful. So, uh, so I will focus on uh, two studies. Uh, I call them study one and study two. And um, the first study, it, it's already published. It was published in Nature Communications. And it was um, the study where we looked at, uh, uh, at the impact of uh, school and non-school related measures on the control of the pandemic in the Netherlands. So this will be study one. And the study two, it's, uh, uh, it's not yet uh, published. It's in press. It was accepted for publication also in Nature Communications. And um, this is the study where we looked at the uh, impact of vaccination on uh, the COVID pandemic and on how the measures, um, uh, the measures such as social distancing measures and other measures uh, need to be relaxed in Portugal as the vaccination is going on. So um, I, I will leave these links, but for example, both studies, so any of the codes or mathematical models, all the information, all the data is shared on my GitHub. So both for the first and for the second study and here are the links. And uh, there are also uh, preprint for this uh, article that will be soon published. And as I said, uh, well, it was a comment that uh, it happened many times that our work ended up on the you know front pages of the main newspapers because of just the importance of the topic and because it was done close uh, closely in collaboration with the um, governments and ministries of health in the two countries and well I was I'm happy that I was also involved also a little bit in uh, uh, explaining this research to the lay public uh, on TV and uh, in newspapers so well I will start with the first study. Um, which is focused on the impact of um, school-related uh, measures in the Netherlands. And to give you a bit of a background, of course, we all live during these lockdowns and this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. But the specific um, situation that was in the Netherlands is that um, um, during the second part of 2020, so starting from autumn, there was a second, a second wave started in the Netherlands. And um, it initiated um, 
almost coinciding with the uh, opening of the schools. And there was a lot of discussion going on on um, well on how to stop the second wave of how to stop the transmission and uh, part of the discussion was about whether the schools could be closed for example to help to control uh, the virus the, the transmission and uh, it's of course a, a difficult topic because there is a high priority to keep schools open um, uh, for many reasons because well students they it's uh, there is a benefit, I guess, due to the you know direct contact, uh, uh, well, direct normal teaching process. But uh, it was also not clear how exactly the pandemic could be controlled, and there was a lot of controversy about how uh, much actually the students contribute uh, to transmission and to the spread of the virus. So we had a, uh, that's the background, and um, we had a few objectives. Uh, in first place, we wanted to see. Uh, what is the effect of the schools-based measures, in, uh, including the school closure during the pandemic, and um, uh, how do other contacts in the society would have to be reduced, or how do the other measures have to be applied in the society so that we can keep schools open and still have the controls, so we don't have, you know, a big, uh, a lot of circulation of the virus. And what is the importance of different school ages? And that's also a very important question because uh, um, when you think about, for example, closing schools, one of the questions, well, which schools to close? Because of course there is a range of ages. It can be, you know, ki kindergartens or elementary schools, primary schools or secondary schools. So these were the three questions which we tried to address. And I'm an infectious disease modeler, so we used uh, a transmission model to uh, answer these questions. And the transmission model, not sure whether you're familiar with it, but I think that conceptually uh, it's um, not difficult perhaps to understand to everybody what you need to do. You need to think of how to partition individuals in the population according to their disease stage. For example, when the virus just starts to spread, everybody is susceptible to the disease and that's represented by this box. But then when the virus is introduced, if the person, uh, susceptible person gets infected, then uh, the person would progress to the next stage and that's a, a latent stage or latent class. And this latent class, it means that the person is uh, carrying the virus, but not yet infectious. So it's not yet transmitting uh, the virus. And then after some days, the person becomes um, infectious and uh, it goes into the infectious stage and so in the when the person is this red box it can infect other susceptible people which is shown by this arrow going back to susceptible and then we make um, a slight uh, um, well modification of the standard seir model if there would be one uh, one box it's just the standard model but we used uh, a several infectious stages uh, just to account for that this allows us to model the um, you know, the duration of infectious period, which is well defined. So if there would be one box, then the duration of infectious period um, uh, on, uh, would be given by the exponential distribution. By, but if you introduce several boxes, it becomes more peaked and more well defined. So, and we work in our work, we did specifically with uh, three stages, and but they are all as infectious. So the infectiousness is the same and then after you leave the last box, you, you recover officially. And you recover, uh, you can recover in two ways. One is when you go to green box, it means that you recovered without going to hospital. So you had either mild or maybe asymptomatic disease, which in, didn't require hospitalization, or you can be um, uh, recovered and go into the uh, hospitalized uh, compartment and um, you end up in this blue box. So that's how we can understand that uh, the model, a simple model. And the model is age structured. So there was, I will go back. So there is this index K and K means the age group. So we can, in general, it's a general formalism. So we can use any number of age groups. Um, but in this specific work, we use 10 age groups. So we partition um, ages into zero to four, five to nine year olds, and then the age categories of 10, so 10 to 19, 20 to 29, and so on. And the last group is uh, everybody who is older than 80. And then we have eight hospitalization groups. So all the children were grouped into one category from zero to 19 years old, and the rest of uh, stages are, uh, sorry, the, the age groups are the same. 
We also, uh, according to the recent literature, we assume that there are different susceptibility, that the different ages can have different susceptibility. So you can be, um, uh, susceptibility is defined for three classes, 0 to 19, 20 to 59, and 60 plus years old. And um, as I said, we have three infectious stages. And uh, well, I put here the equations, not sure whether people know, but this is uh, just a, a standard system of um, um, ordinary differential equations where uh, we work with the number of people in a given compartment at time t. And uh, for example, S of K of T means the number of susceptible people in uh, H class K at time T. And then we can write down how the people's progress. And I would just uh, like to uh, focus on how the force of, uh, in of infection is expressed. It's lambda k of t. And the force of infection, so this is the uh, force of infection. It's uh, the rate with which susceptible individuals progress into the exposed state. So um, it's, uh, it's written here. So beta k is the susceptibility, which can be different for different groups. And then this rate, it depends on, on the probability of transmission per contact epsilon, but it also depends on the number of contacts between individual and uh, age group k and individuals um, in age group L. And L, it can be anybody. So if you think of SK, for example, number of people in the uh, 60 to 70 age, uh, uh, for number of people for the age category 60 to 70 years old, then um, L would be all other age groups, including 60 to 70 and so on. And then you multiply this by the proportion of infectious people in, uh, in each age group. So I think that clarifies a little bit how the infection process is set. And then uh, for the CKL, which I showed here, so CKL is then uh, other contact um, rates. So we use the data that was collected uh, for the Netherlands. And um, uh, Netherlands was quite lucky because the data was collected also both before the pandemic. So there are the contact matrices before the pandemic, but there are also the contact matrices that were measured uh, after the pandemic. So the surveys, contact surveys have been performed among exactly the same individuals. And um, well, so the, they are shown here um, so here are the specific contact, uh, contacts before the pandemic and the data from 2016-17. And this is after the pandemic. The scale is different, so it's always yellow to, to red. And red denotes, denotes the number of contacts per day. And when it's uh, um, the, the most red denotes the maximum. And here the maximum was 9.3. And here was the maximum 1.5 after the lockdown. So what it means that, for example, so that's the red square. So it means that the number of contacts between uh, uh, for a person um, who is 10 to 20 years old uh, was about nine uh, with individuals in the same age group, 10 to 20 years old. And then it was less with other age groups. And that's, of course, you see this diagonal pattern. That's because uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, school children, they have a lot of contacts with uh, children of the same age and much fewer contacts with uh, people uh, individuals from other ages. And then when the lockdown was introduced, uh, the pattern a bit changed because the schools were closed in the Netherlands. So um, you see that there was a, a lot of red and both the absolute number decreased, but uh, also there were, the maximum was not anymore only in children, but in general, it's a, w was among age working people, let's say. And the contacts on average, they were reduced by 71%. And we use also the specific matrix uh, for the schools after the pandemic. And you see it here, um, where most of the contacts are, of course, between children of the same age group. So uh, apart from using this contact matrix, is what we need to know in the model is uh, when this transition exactly happens uh, between uh, before the pandemic, between the contact uh, matrices uh, before the pandemic and after the pandemic, and um, how fast it happens. So um, what we uh, do in our model, we actually can estimate exactly this timing when this transition happens and how fast it happens. And we do so by writing that the general contact rate is just a linear combination of the contact matrices before the lockdown, which is BKL, plus the contact uh, matrix after the lockdown, AKL. So it's a sum. 
and the coefficients are 1 minus f plus f, where f is a logistic function. So the logistic function is just a function that goes from 0 to 1. So if you have the logistic function, which is 0 in the beginning, let's say uh, then you have only, so this, is, this term is 0, then you have only the contact matrix before the pandemic, and then uh, um, if it's 1, then you have only the contact matrix uh, uh, after the pandemic. You, you would have only this term multiplied by the C1. And these parameters of the logistic function, the K1 and T1, they govern like the slope of the logistic function is K1 and T1 is this midpoint where the, the function equals one half. And we, these two parameters are estimated. So that's how we model the transition. And you can do in the similar way also the transition. Um, so from uh, before uh, the pandemic is uh, started, until the first lockdown, but then during the lockdown, schools were closed, and you can use a similar ideas to model the next transition. So after the first lockdowns, the measures were released, um, uh, relaxed slightly, and the schools also opened, and you can model uh, the transition also in a, in a similar way. So uh, which data do we use uh, to fit the model? Um, we use two data sources. One is based on uh, age stratified hospital admissions. So this is the number of new hospitalizations per day in uh, the age categories that we use. And we use the data because it was done quite a long time ago already. We use the data only uh, from the first wave, which was uh, roughly 70 days, a first pandemic wave. And um, uh, the pandemic in the Netherlands started, um, the first case was on 22nd of February. Um, and we assume, sorry, we, uh, the first case, uh, the first notified case was um, uh, 27 of February, and we assume that the pandemic starts before that, the first notified case. And uh, we estimate what was the number of, uh, what was the number of cases uh, five days before the 27th of February, so on, on 22nd of February, how many already cases there were in the population, and we assume that there were, well, uh, that there were no hospitalizations during this initial period. And then we use also the age stratified serological data, and this data shows what was the percentage of people who have had the infection already. Um, in, a, um, in the uh, certain age classes. And uh, this was also, this data was collected um, and the median date of collection was April 1st. So th that was like exactly um, after, um, uh, closer towards the end of the first wave. And the average seroprevalence in the population was 2.3%. Uh, the model is fit uh, using uh, STARM uh, with R interface and we use the Bayesian uh, framework uh, uh, for that. So um, let me, um, so uh, to give you an idea um, how things work, so we estimate the parameter values, they are not fixed, everything is estimated, and for example, the probability of transmission per contact is about 7%. Uh, we estimate that the reduction in probability of transmission per contact due uh, to other measures after the first lockdown uh, such as uh, mask wearing and so on is estimated at 49%. And then the latent period is 2.5 days and infectious period is uh, 4.8 days. So and these are the distributions, the estimated distributions and red is the median and the red dashed lines are the confidence intervals, the credible intervals. And then we also estimate that uh, the susceptibility of people changes with age. And uh, the susceptibility among uh, children, which we define as broadly as a zero to 20 year old uh, uh, persons is, uh, uh, they are 23% as uh, susceptible as uh, the oldest age group, which is a, a 60 plus age category. And then the susceptibility of um, 20 to 60 year olds to 60 year olds is 61%. So the younger you are, the more susceptible you are, and the older you are, the more susceptible you are. And uh, the susceptibility of 60 plus years old is taken to be one. So it's relative to the susceptibility of 60 plus year olds. Then uh, we estimate also the probability of hospitalization in different age groups. So basically, what's the chance that uh, if, you, uh, if you get uh, uh, infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, what's the chance that you would be hospitalized? And this plot is on the log scale. So these are different age groups and this probability of hospitalization. And you see on the log scale, it's almost linear. So um, it's the probability of hospitalization is increasing exponentially. And uh, uh, for this data set, um, 
we see that it's around like 0.1% uh, probability for the youngest age group. And for the oldest age group, it's 5%. So five out of, um, of 4.4. Well, 4 .4. So 4.4 individuals out of 100 would get uh, hospitalized if they are um, 80 years old or, uh, uh, or older. And um, um, the model fits um, are shown in this plot where we have number of new hospitalizations per day. And these are the days since the first uh, case in the Netherlands. And the data, the hospitalizations themselves are shown as red dots. And they are shown uh, here, the red dots in each plot. And different panels, they correspond to different age groups. You see that, of course, in um, the youngest age category, well, they have a lower probability of hospitalizations, relatively few hospitalizations, so the pattern is more noisy. But in the older age groups, you see there was a clear, clearly uh, seeing this is the first wave. And um, the black line shows um, our model, median model predictions. And the uh, dashed, um, oh, sorry, uh, shaded, uh, gray shaded region are the credible intervals of the model. Uh, um, so you see that most of the data points, they also fall within these credible intervals. Since we fit to the two data sources, we also uh, show, I can also show you the fit of the zero, uh, to the zero prevalence data. And the zero prevalence data, so this is the percentage of people who are infected in a given age category, it's shown as a dot. Uh, with some uh, also, also confidence intervals, and the red is the um, uh, the red is the predictions model predictions. So this is a violent plots based on the model predictions, and also for uh, the most part, we see that our all our model predictions they mainly fit within the prediction intervals. But overall, the several prevalence was still quite low, and there were also no reinfections during this period. So which was good. So what we try to do next, uh, we look at the different public health measures that were introduced. And uh, the, well, the goal of all these measures is to keep uh, the epidemic from spreading. And to keep the epidemic from spreading, you need to have that uh, uh, the effective reproduction number um, uh, for the virus is uh, lower than one. So the effective reproduction number is uh, has been advertised <laughs> At least in the in the Netherlands and in Portugal, a lot on TV. So I think even uh, you know common people start to understand what it, that is, and that's just a, a number of people one infectious person would infect uh, in um, in the, during its infectious period when the rest of the people are susceptible, and it's called effective reproduction number because we assume that uh, there are measures already in place. So when there are no measures and the uh, epidemic or pandemic just starts it's the it's called the basic reproductive number so um so we look at two types of the control measures as i said so we look at the measures that are targeted at children and school children and the, the measures that targeted at the rest of the population and that's the schematic of the dutch pandemic uh, uh, if you wish so in the green is are uh, shown the measures that were uh, affecting schools so light green, it means that the schools were open. Of course, the pandemic started at the end of February and the schools were open. Then uh, the schools were closed in mid-March, on the 16th of March, all of them. And then they stayed closed um, until very briefly opening um, uh, for a few, very, very short time until they closed again, just because there was a, a summer break. So basically through all the period until the schools opened uh, in September or at the end of August, uh, the schools were closed, and then um, when we conducted our study, the schools were open completely without, uh, well, without uh, uh, significant measures, let's say. Uh, regarding the other measures in society, well, the measures started to be introduced at the end of February, and the country went into full lockdown at the, uh, in the mid-April, so that was the most stringent measures. And then when the first wave was controlled, the measures were again uh, relaxed uh, somewhere in the end of uh, May, beginning of uh, June. And then uh, when there was a second wave, which coincides roughly with the second period, so the measures were also increasing in intensity again, which is shown as darker red. And RE was... Uh, uh, was estimated that well are not uh, this actually are not was estimated 2.7 in the beginning of the pandemic then it was during the first lockdown reduced to 0 0.62 then it increased again to 1.61 um uh, when the schools were opening 
um, just opened, so end of August, and then it was one roughly at the end of uh, November. So, uh, so you have this overview. So we look at different scenarios, and the scenarios are um, they are consider either decreasing the school contacts up to the school closure and keeping keeping the rest of the contacts in, in, in the society fixed, or decreasing the non school contacts until. Um, um, and, and decreasing non-school contacts, but keeping the rest of the school, school contacts fixed. So if you think just in general in the society, it can be, well, do we want to take any measures in schools only and we don't do anywhere else? Uh, so we don't close restaurants and so on. Or do we do something in the society, but we keep the schools open? And we do this in, uh, it, in two time points. So one uh, is when schools just opened. That was August 2020, when RE was 1.3. And the other one was um, when RE was 1, and it was uh, November 2020. So there was a very hard to control uh, the pandemic at that point, because it seemed like uh, all the measures were already exhausted that were not schools, but uh, schools at that point were open. And then, um, so we look at how actually the effective reproduction number that measures how much we control the pandemic would change at these two different time points. And in August 2020, uh, we see that we start with 1.3, which is estimated, and then um, we, uh, we do this scenario in which we reduce all other contacts, for example, to the maximum level of August 2020, which was the most stringent lockdown. And we see that, uh, well, um, RE would be already below one if you would reduce the contact by 60% at that time point. And in the lowest point, it would be um, 0.83. Uh, if we would, uh, if 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 uh, if uh, in August 2020 the country would go uh, in a similar lockdown as in, as in April, that's what would happen. And if we would uh, actually only close schools at that time point, and here you see the reduction. So this is effective reproduction number and reduction in school contacts, only in school contacts when the rest of the contacts are as they were. You see that well, you all, only if even if all schools would be completely closed the RE would be decreased, uh, well, um, only by 10%, something like from 1.3 to 1.18. So if uh, RE is reduced only by this small amount, so it doesn't go below 1, what it tells us that even if schools would not uh, have opened in, um, uh, in, uh, at the end of August, um, then uh, the second wave uh, would not be prevented. So the, the not opening of schools would not have prevented the second wave, just because there was too much circulation in the rest of the society. So closing schools basically doesn't solve the problem. Then we did the same exercise, but November 2020, when R was 1. And here you see two panels. Again, that's effective reproduction number, and that's reduction in other contacts. Um, in the society or in school contacts, and you see that you start with one and you reduce to roughly 1.8 something, and it's similar, the reduction would be similar also for the schools. So at this point, reducing, uh, closing schools completely, for example, um, uh, would could actually help to achieve control and uh, to reduce the RE by value much, well, by uh, to make it smaller than one. And, um, what it tells us is that the impact of schools, it depends on where we start with, how much actually measures are taken, you know, how much, uh, uh, how many measures are in the rest of the society. And at this point in November, the impact of schools would be comparable and um, school contacts and non-school contacts would be comparable. Then we looked also at different school ages and that's shown here. Uh, where we close schools only for zero to five year olds or five to 10 or 10 to 20 year olds. And you see that the impact, again, starting from the value of one, the impact, which is shown by the RE, which is shown by the black curve, it, uh, it's the largest for the oldest school children. And the reason for that is that, and it's almost, uh, well, there is almost no impact if you close schools for zero to five year olds. And the reason for that is that, um, well, this, children, 0 to 10 to 20 year old, they have actually the largest number of contacts. So 0 to 5 year olds, they have smaller contacts. That's why there is a, there is a, a much larger impact. So basically, if you do any interventions, they should be targeted at all the school children.
just because they are also they are also more susceptible than younger school children and uh, they have more contacts. So this finishes uh, my uh, let's say the first part of my presentation. And um, the main conclusions are that, um, well, that all the school children have a largest impact on transmission. That was actually my previous slide. Then uh, uh, closing schools, well, in the Netherlands after the summer break uh, in August would not have prevented a second wave in autumn 2020 because there was too much circulating. And even by closing schools, you would not uh, bring the effective reproduction number below one. And uh, overall, by comparing the two scenarios that we had, we see that the impact of measures reducing the school-based contact depends on the remaining opportunities to reduce non-school-based contact. So if you start too high, you can't expect that by just closing schools, you can solve uh, you know, all the problems and achieve control. And I will move on to the second study, which is, uh, uses very similar uh, uh, methodology as my previous study. So I hope to go a bit faster. And that this study is focused on the um, vaccination against SARS-CoV-2 uh, in Portugal. And uh, well, the background for this study is that, well, the, Portugal had uh, three waves of uh, COVID-19. I will also show them. And vaccination in Portugal started at the end of December 2020. And the government, as uh, many other governments, <laughs> Portuguese government was struggling to choose uh, the right mix of measures. So both that uh, to keep the pandemic under control, but also to allow for some social and economic activity. So because you start vaccinating, well, how much you can actually open up because uh, Portugal was also in the lockdown, as I will explain. And um, well, the objective is like our main message was what, what would be the impact of vaccination on the transmission dynamics and um, specifically, we also try to answer when and which uh, control measures can be relaxed as the vaccination is rolled out. And we use the transmission model again, and the model was quite similar to my previous model. So if you look at the upper part, so we have S, E, I, R, and from I compartment, you can be uh, either recover if you have uh, mild symptoms or you can be hospitalized if you have severe disease. And uh, we, we use only one eye compartment here. In the previous model, there were several, just because the model is more complex and we try to keep it uh, minimal. And then if uh, from each of these disease stages, uh, S, E, R, and H, you can be, uh, in, uh, if, in, um, you can be vaccinated. And that's because that's the guideline that uh, everybody can be vaccinated irrespective whether you already had COVID or if you, um, of you didn't have COVID, so anybody can be vaccinated unless if you are ill, you're not advised to actually get vaccinated. So we assume that when you're in infectious compartment, you would not get vaccinated. And then if you're vaccinated, you go in the uh, boxes uh, SV, EV, so this is a vaccinated susceptible, vaccinated later, and so on. And the difference between the people who are susceptible or those who are susceptible vaccinated is that, um, um, is that, um, the uh, susceptibility to disease would be reduced. So this is vaccine efficacy in reducing susceptibility. And um, the second effect of the vaccine is that people who are in this IV compartment, uh, they are uh, can be less infectious. So there is vaccine efficacy in reducing infectivity. It's not shown in the figure, but uh, it's included in the equations. And then finally, the very well known effect of vaccines. Sorry, a very well known effect of vaccines is that um, if you are um, vaccinated, and then uh, your chance or probability of hospitalization is reduced, and that's um, modeled by the vaccine efficacy in preventing hospitalization or death. And the model is very similar. It has 10 age classes. Here we also use all 10 hospitalization classes and vaccination classes and so on. Um, yeah, and three. And we use this similar data, but it's much longer data set because we use hospital admissions uh, uh, for almost uh, one year. So since the first case, until 15 of January 2021. Um, so it involves uh, three pandemic waves. And the pandemic also in, the, in Portugal also started similarly on uh, the 26th of February 2020, as in the Netherlands. So it was similar in Europe, more or less. Uh, and we used the age certified serological data, which was also collected after the first pandemic wave. Um, and the date, the median date of collection was 28th of May. So um, in the similar way, we use the contact patterns. 
for the Portugal, we had to infer actually the contact patterns after the first uh, pandemic wave because uh, there was no specifically data collected within the country. So we used the um, uh, data uh, from the Netherlands to infer what would be how the contacts would be changed for Portugal. And we see that, uh, uh, well, in our basic setup uh, before the pandemic, people had on average 12 contacts per day infection relevant contacts and after the first pandemic there would be five contacts per day and that's uh, uh, just a graph how shows how the contacts changed from before to after the pandemic so this is the age group of the person and this is the number of contacts that you would have so for example if you're five to ten year old before the pandemic you would have uh, about uh, um, 18 contacts i guess and also the same for 10 to 20 year olds and then this would be reduce uh, decrease with age but after the pandemic which is shown uh, in this uh, blue line uh, you see that this curve is almost flat so almost everybody would have five uh, contacts per day and why is that so the contacts were much less reduced for the older people you see that the difference is much less than for the younger people because we, well the younger people the schools were also closed in portugal and um so the contacts were reduced a lot, but for the uh, people who are older, they were reduced to much uh, smaller extent because they already have essential contacts. So if you're old and you need some care, so most of your contacts are already with the um, either healthcare personnel or maybe with the people who provide care to you, your family and so on. And the difference with this work is what we have done is that there have been several transitions during the pandemic. So the first, first lockdown, then there was the measures after the first lockdown, they were relaxed. Uh, then after the measures were relaxed, then there was further relaxation because schools opened. And this happened at the end of August. So this, this is the start of the, this is the first lockdown. This is the first relaxation, which was in May. Then the schools opened. Then after the schools opened, there started a new wave. And there was a, a second emergency state announced in the uh, beginning of November. And then finally, there was a, a next uh, relaxation happened because of uh, Christmas and school holidays. So a lot of contacts were increased. So what we do is that we estimate this transition. So we don't put them in, but we estimate when they happened exactly, what was the median time when they happened, and we estimate also how fast they happened. So you see that these are individual trajectories, and sometimes, uh, yeah, there is a, some difference. So sometimes you estimate uh, uh, that, uh, um, you know, that there, there is slightly different timing, and the black lines, they show actually the median estimated trajectory. And then uh, we fit also the, the model, as I said, that is fit to hospitalization data, and these are uh, the uh, the data uh, for different age categories. So I will focus just on 80 plus age category because here the pattern is the most clear. So um, so there was a first wave uh, from March till May. Then there was a low epidemic activity during the next um, during the next uh, few months until September when schools opened. And then there was a large second wave, which was slightly curbed because there was a second emergency state. And then because of the um, Christmas and so on, there was a next relaxation and this was the third wave that started. And we also fit the uh, seroprevalence data. Um, here you can see the fit and this uh, violent shapes is the model and confidence intervals are the data. And we estimate something like between 1.8 to 4.6% of uh, infected individuals in different age categories. And that's, we see, this is uh, estimated from the model how uh, the seroprevalence was increasing with time. So, um, and the, this point is actually the data, the, the median seroprevalence in the population. So we estimate that by, by 15 of January, about 19.4% have been infected with COVID already in Portugal. And um, that's a summary slide. So uh, this is the total hospitalizations uh, estimated as they are. So the number of new hospitalizations per day, which show clearly the pattern, these green lines are the estimated transition in hospitalizations. So, um, so this is the first lockdown, introduction of the first lockdown, relaxation of measures. That's uh, the school opening and the associated relaxation and measures due to school opening. Uh, introduction of the uh, second emergency state and the relaxation due to the uh, new year and Christmas. And uh, the black line are the model and the red points are the data. 
The, we also estimate how the average contacts changed in the population. And um, this is just the uh, mean, so average number of contacts. But we, uh, we also estimate how they change for different age groups. And the, we started with 12 contacts per day. Then we went into lockdown when the number of contacts was about four. Then after the relaxation, we went up. So during summer 2020, there was like roughly six contacts per day. And then schools opened, it went again up and went down and so on. And what we do in our model is we take these levels instead of uh, to project how uh, measures need to be relaxed. Um, we use uh, these levels that were achieved in the past. So we say that, for example, when the measures are relaxed, we will uh, have the same number of contacts as in summer 2020 or the same number of contacts as in autumn 2020 or the pre-pandemic number of contacts, which was 12. And then um, we also estimate the e effective reproduction number, and that's uh, actually calculated, taking into account also the number of people uh, who are available for infection. So we, we take into account already the seroprevalence estimated for the, by the model. And it's a time-dependent value, and you see that it was started with a value above two, uh, when downstate barely below one during summer, when um, there was low virus circulation and went up and so on. And uh, our E is smaller than one, as I said before, it means that uh, we have a, a control of the epidemic, but here we distinguish a partial control. So you can have a control, but you have a lot of measures in the population and the contact rates, they're much smaller than pre-pandemic levels. And full control, it means when your RE is smaller than one, and you also have the pre-pandemic level of contacts. Um, we implemented the vaccination program as it was proposed by the government at the end of um, uh, 2020, so before the, uh, this, before the vaccination actually started. And the, this plan assumes that there are different vaccination phases, probably in the same way as in other countries. So in the beginning, the healthcare workers would be vaccinated and the residents and staff of long-term care facilities or people with different uh, morbidities or different other associated diseases, for example, coronary heart disease and so on. And then uh, there was a, a, a next phase assumed that there would be also vaccination of people um, according to different mor morbidities like diabetes and so on. And then the progression would happen according to the uh, according to the age. And finally, in the last phase, everybody between 20 to 65 years of age would be vaccinated. And there were different periods uh, defined and number of people. So the plan assumes that all population would be vaccinated, which is 10.8 million, that's population of Portugal, which actually includes, uh, which actually includes children. And the guidelines were saying that actually children cannot be vaccinated. Anybody between zero and 18 years of age was not eligible. So we made uh, uh, slight modifications to the plan. Also, there was a, a measure, um, the intent to get vaccinated in Portugal, which was very high. It was actually 95%. So most of the people wanted to follow the advice of the government. So in our model, we used maximum coverage of 90%. Uh, we assumed that, well, that like according to the guidelines, the persons who are um, less than 20 years old, they are not vaccinated. Uh, the vaccine that was distributed was a Pfizer vaccine because at the, mo at the moment when we performed the study, it was 96% of total doses distributed well, according to uh, that was Pfizer uh, brand. Uh, then the vaccine has also infection blocking uh, properties so that uh, um, it, it, it also the susceptibility to disease is reduced, but also infectivity is reduced. So it's not only... Uh, reduction in disease, but also in, in transmission. And uh, the model vaccination is just one event. So we don't model uptake of first and second dose. We say, well, when you're vaccinated, you, got, you get your full two doses. And uh, we used two sets. One was optimistic set of vaccine efficacy. So when the efficacy against uh, infection is quite high and another one was a pessimistic set when the uh, efficacy against infection was uh, not so high and in my main analysis so we assume that the people behave in exactly the same way because you can imagine that people who get vaccinated is that they don't get um, um, so they start to increase the number of contacts because they're not so scared anymore and we have done sensitivity analysis for that, but uh, in the main results, we assume that there is no behavior compensation or behavior change. 
And that's how the rollout uh, of vaccination was supposed to happen. That's the plan. So it started the vaccination rate is the number of people vaccinated per day. Um, and uh, in different colors, you see different age groups. So, and the black line is the total vaccination rate. So it started at the end of uh, 2020. And then, um, well, it, it started quite low because there was a vaccine availability was low and then it was supposed to increase uh, already from May, uh, starting in May. And uh, in the beginning, there would be, well, in equal proportions, uh, 20 to 60 year olds, uh, roughly 60 plus year olds would be vaccinated because this includes healthcare workers and uh, um, uh, uh, also staff in the long term care facilities, for example, but also elderly people. And then um, starting in the, you know, in the later part, there would be mainly people vaccinated who are younger. Um, and we also used the data, the actual data on these different comorbidities in the population. So we introduced a lot of detail, realistic detail into uh, regarding the vaccination plan. So we used the actual data about what was the age distribution of people with uh, certain comorbidities they included in the vaccination plan. And uh, well, what you see that most of this, of course, uh, they appear in people who are older. So this is a, a proportion of the population who has uh, certain comorbidity. And this is the distribution according to age group. So most of them, they are distributed into older people. And only, for example, obesity uh, shows up in uh, younger people. So, and uh, we project how the vaccination uh, coverage would change actually with time based on that plan. And this is the total vaccination coverage, which started, uh, well, which increased and was uh, in May 2021 was uh, supposed to reach 9% and actually didn't update my slide, but it exactly reached 9%. So these are the data for the first dose and the second dose, um, actual data, and that's our projection that we make. And then, um, uh, well, this was based, the slide is based on my, uh, I guess, previous result, but I updated and it was the agreement was really good. And then in May, it was supposed to be increased until uh, uh, August, until uh, the coverage would reach 38% and then finally 73% at the end of the vaccination campaign, which is supposed to finish at the end of uh, 2021. And we also calculate how this vaccination coverage would change in different uh, age groups and so on. So we have a few scenarios, and these scenarios are about how to relax the measures. So one is the simplest one. What if you just relax all measures completely and we go to pre-pandemic lifestyle, pre-pandemic contacts? Another scenario is that uh, if you lift uh, the measures uh, partially, as in autumn 2020, so where there was a quite a few contacts, but not, of course, uh, far from the pre-pandemic number of contacts, then the scenario three is relaxing measures as in summer 2020. And scenario four is a stepwise relaxation. That's what some of the many of the countries are doing now in Europe is when you first relax a little bit, if the situation is good, you continue and so on. And I will show you one result, which is was the most favorable scenario, which is a stepwise relaxation, which is shown here. Again, I show hospitalizations, number of hospitalizations per day, and this is the time axis. Uh, the RE. Uh, so effective reproduction number uh, dependent on time until the end. And this is average contacts. And this is the proportion of population who has been protected via vaccination or natural infection. So um, uh, let's start with the first one, with the hospitalizations. And uh, the stepwise relaxation, so the red dots are actually the data that I already showed you before. And the black line is that the model projections. And uh, you see that there were three waves, first wave, second wave, and this is the third wave. Actually, this wave was caused by the British variant mainly. And then we assume that there are three steps. So relaxation happens in three steps. On 1st of April, we increase the contacts. So this is the estimated contacts. And we re uh, increase these contacts as in summer 2020. So this is, was the same level. Then on 1st of June, we release the, uh, increase the contacts uh, as in autumn 2020, so that's the same level. And then on 1st of October, finally, we go to the pre-pandemic level, so we release all measures completely. And it was intentionally, this scenario was intentionally chosen so that you don't have many hospitalizations. As you see, after the uh, wave declines, so you have very low level and it never goes up. So, um, uh, of course, it depends exactly on the timing, but 
this was the point was to show that if you relax the measure slowly, that you can avoid new uh, waves of hospitalizations. And at the end, so we calculate, so this is the number of people who stay unprotected. So this is a who stay susceptible, which would be about, uh, well, lower than 20% at the end of, uh, in January, 2022. And then 48% of people would be protected through vaccination and roughly 36% of people would be protected due to natural infection. So they just had the virus, but they could be also vaccinated as well. So. Uh, and um, the, interestingly, because you want always to see whether the effective reproduction number is small or larger than one when you relax the measures, so the effective reproduction number would actually be larger than one after you relax the, uh, you do the second step of the relaxation, which is shown by this blue line. So you see the RE goes above one, and then um, uh, it would decrease because there would be vaccination going on. And then when you relax on 1st of October, you would also go uh, and have an effective reproduction number above one. And what it means, but you don't see increase in hospitalizations. And what happens is that there would be still uh, increased circulation of the virus. But um, because mainly the people who, uh, who, have, uh, who are vulnerable, who have comorbidities or uh, who are older, they would be already vaccinated by that point. Um, you have the virus circulation, but you don't incre have increase in hospital admissions. And the full control of the pandemic would be achieved on 8th of February 2022. What we estimate, that's when the RE goes below one. And also we have the pre-pandemic level of contacts. That's what we actually want to have in, uh, you know, in the society. And... Uh, uh, I, I gave you one example. I said that the third step first uh, happens on 1st of October. But if you do uh, if you do relax the measures early, for example, if you go to pre-pandemic level of contacts already on 1st of August of 2020, so everything is released, nobody's wearing masks, nothing is going on, so everything is before the pandemic, you see that there would be still a uh, quite large increase in hospitalizations in our model, which is, uh, uh, which is shown uh, here. And it would be roughly comparable to the first wave. And that's because there will be, um, yeah, the younger age groups, they're not fully vaccinated yet. And although the hospitalization rate of younger individuals is much lower, if everything is, uh, uh, all the measures are relaxed, then there will be still a lot of hospitalizations and uh, this would leave uh, a new wave. Also, uh, we see that our results are quite sensitive uh, to, uh, quite sensitive uh, um, to our assumptions regarding the vaccine efficacies. Those results that I showed you, they assumed a, a very um, uh, effective vaccine in reducing transmission. But if the uh, vaccine efficacy is decreased uh, because, uh, uh, well, uh, because, for example, different antigenic uh, variants that are circulating, if a new variant starts to circulate, or just because you have, uh, in reality, you have a compositional vaccines, maybe, um, our results are based on a Pfizer vaccine, but if there are other vaccines that have lower efficacy, then you can still have increase in hospitalizations in the second part, so in the autumn of 2021, so which is uh, shown here. So before it was almost a flat line, and now you see actually a peak. So um, that's uh, also possible. Moreover, the situation can get worse. Um, if there would be both decreased vaccine efficacy, but also if people would change their behavior, in particular, if the vaccinated people uh, increase their contact to pre-pandemic levels, so they just start to lead normal life thinking that they are vaccinated, but there is a still a small chance that they get infected um, after the vaccination and they contribute to transmission, you see that also could lead uh, quite a large, uh, well, um, uh, chance of a wave uh, in the second uh, half of uh, 2021. And uh, I mentioned other scenarios. I don't have, uh, I think, time to go completely in the detail through the scenarios, and that was not the point. But we looked also at, uh, at scenarios where you, uh, well, right in spring, you go to pre-pandemic level of contacts. That was scenario one. Or if you only release the contacts as in autumn, 2020 or in uh, summer 2020 and you see that of course if you would uh, completely open up already in spring that you would have a very huge uh, outbreak so the RE would uh, would increase uh, very much and the hospitalizations would also increase very much there would be very large peak 
and that's because uh, and uh, but you would help uh, you would achieve control quite quickly because there are a lot of people would be uh, infected and you achieve control not through vaccination but through the natural infection and in the other scenarios the situation is a bit more favorable in particular if you release the contacts as in summer 2020 when there was no outbreak you would also not expect to have it so that's safe to do let's say and if you do something like in autumn then you can have a, a small chance of outbreak so it's just a, a small summary i i'm not going to go uh, through all the details but uh, the conclusions of the second part is that uh, well the quick relaxation might lead to new waves. So if you immediately go to pre-pandemic level of contacts, that will definitely uh, lead to a new wave of hospitalizations despite the vaccination. And uh, um, there are still a lot of measures are necessary throughout 2021 20, until you know full control of the pandemic can be achieved. And in more favorable scenarios, the measures are relaxed as a, a gradually until the end of 2021. Uh, I, I'm also frequently asked about another option, and that would be, well, what if the vaccination rates increase very much? And, well, of course, if you would vaccinate all the population within one day, I think you would be basically done. You, you can open up the society completely, but uh, there are different constraints, um, you know, because the vaccines are... Um, um, well, there are contracts made for the vaccine supply and so on. And uh, so far, at least until one month ago, uh, the agreement for our model, there was a good agreement uh, between the projected vaccination coverage and actually achieved vaccination coverage. Uh, and uh, I think that's all uh, what I wanted to say. So, yeah, I will probably stop sharing my slides. And George, if... Uh, yes, uh, I'm here for the Gunners. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Uh, it was like very interesting, especially because it had some comments here. But uh, I mean, you can uh, I can start maybe with uh, Kalyan Das. Uh, he he if he wants to come here to talk with us, uh, I can send him the link. Uh, I know him because he, he wrote a paper recently, I, I, I guess it was a, a, a review paper about uh, COVID modeling. He, I saw his paper, uh, he, like he tried, if I understood properly, I didn't read all the paper, but if I, if I understood properly what he did, he tried to do a huge amount of a kind of review of the uh, several mathematical model about COVID. And uh, he didn't want to comment, uh, but uh, he comment like this, uh, it's nice, uh, nice lecture, but not get an idea how to formulate the mathematical model of COVID. So the idea was not, was not to be a lecture in the sense of teaching uh, COVID modeling specifically, but maybe if you want, you can maybe talk a little bit more about the, uh, the process that you design the model, the difficulty. Please keep in mind that you already have in this channel a very short lecture of Professor Gunnar. I did uh, like five minutes, she explained more or less how to not necessarily in the details, because I'm quite sure she published a paper in Nature, so I believe that uh, this model is quite complex, I, all the details and so on. Yeah. But uh, maybe you can talk in briefly. Uh, yeah, I think how... I can explain. And um, you mean uh, Kalyan Das, right? This question that he... Uh, um... Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I can explain why, well, why I didn't include that many mathematical details. There is no problem with that for me to explain in the mathematical details. Um, I think uh, it's actually one of the comments that I have received in the past year is because this topic is very interesting to all people and not all people can understand the details. So people actually want to understand the concepts and what you can do with the models and what you can predict with the models but they don't necessarily know you know like uh, ordinary differential equations or partially differential equations and so on so i actually changed the style of my talks quite a bit during the pandemic so that a lot of people can understand them um but i can uh, maybe i can show the slides uh, with the equations back yes let me and, share again just a minute i'll share again okay now we are with your slides again so please okay so uh, let me uh, that's good, but I need to open the, because I, I had it. Yeah, oh, okay, it's here. So um, this is a, a, a so-called uh, deterministic compartmental models. 
And in deterministic compartmental models, as I said, you need to define what are the different compartments that you have. And compartments are defined, but what are the disease stages you have? So when you have a, a, a disease spreading in the population, you need to think what are the processes that take in place. And then you just uh, formulate them mathematically. And as I said, the process is that the people go through, you know, a sequence of states, typically. You are uh, susceptible in the beginning to the disease, and then you go into the latent class. And from the latent class, you go, you become infectious. And from the infectious stage, you go either to recover or you go to the hospital. So the first, uh, yeah, the first step is define these different states that are important in your model. You can make this more detailed. For example, you could also include, you know, symptomatic or symptomatic infections, split these boxes into two and so on. So our model, this it's quite simple model. It was chosen in such a way that we can uniquely identify the parameters of the model because we don't take just parameters from the literature. What we do is that we estimate these parameters so that they fit the data that we have. And um, um, how do you model actually, uh, uh, well, what are the equations? So like, what are the equations that describe this model? I think I, I also um, tried to explain this a little bit. So you need to describe how people progress between these different boxes. So you need to uh, write down the rate of change, for example, of the number of susceptible individuals with time. Uh, um, and the number of susceptible individuals with time, it only, it only decreases due to infection because the people only go you know, from susceptible to uh, uh, exposed state. And uh, you write down the infection term and the infection term is just, well, how the uh, susceptibles would decrease. This is the number of susceptible people that you have at time t times the rate with which they are uh, decreasing. And the rate is, um, well, it's something that is called the force of infection. Um, so that's this term. Then when you go when you go in the exposed state, so from this state, well, the susceptibles decrease, the exposed uh, number of exposed people, it increases with time. So you have exactly the same term. So you, you, you uh, exposed increase. And then the exposed people leave the compartment only in one way. Um, they go into the infectious state, and um, because we assume um, we assume that our rates are, for example, um, well, if you would assume that the, the rates are exponentially distributed, you have only uh, one. Um, sorry, you you go with the rate alpha. So this is the latent period. Then you transit in the first compartment, and so on. So it, it's actually. Um, I think that the formulation is is not quite difficult if you know the if you know the differential equations and if you if you can think about how to write the rate of change for the number of people in a in a given compartment it's quite a standard procedure but I think if you if you don't know this formulation that's also probably quite hard to you know to grasp it too quickly so I didn't spend so much time on this and the choice of the model as I said that it's governed by that what are the data that we have that we want to fit and uh, which parameters we can uniquely identify in the model. So, for example, one of the questions that I ask sometimes, so why don't we split these people who are infectious into those who are symptomatic or asymptomatic? Well, we don't split them because we don't have any information, like, uh, you know, we don't have any data about how many infectious uh, individuals are, for example, what is the proportion exactly of infectious individuals that is asymptomatic and so on. Because the only data is what was the total proportion of people seroprevalence, so how, what's the proportion of people that have been infected by a given time point, and uh, how many people in each of these age groups got to the hospital. So it's... Um, um, not sure how detailed it is. If you have uh, more questions, and if, uh, maybe I can reply, you know, by email or so, I can give you more. But uh, uh, I think that the top, the talk was supposed to be more conceptual and less focused on just, uh, you know, one, 
little detail. Yeah. But uh, uh, keep in mind, uh, I mean, I'm talking about to the, to the listeners that uh, I'm planning to launch a course on the SR model, the base, the basic. So maybe in the future I can invite Professor Gunner to prepare a special model in which she, because my idea was to create a course because I so recently I participated from a scientific event in Brazil. It was like four days just about COVID models. I noticed that all the models I, I, I found, somehow they were connected to the SI model. I thought maybe I can create a course with the basics. And maybe in the advanced part of the course, I can invite Professor Gunnar to maybe to give more detail. But the idea of this, uh, this talk was specifically to show you how Gunnar was able to, uh, to do this model, more of a kind of a talk, not like lecture in the, in the, in the strict sense. Mm -hmm. So let um, me, let me, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, I actually teach infectious disease modeling in, uh, in the, uh, my university and we have different uh, students, students who have, for example, medical education, so they don't know that much math. So maybe indeed uh, uh, I could uh, contribute a bit with explaining the simple model. And the models are much simpler. So you go with just basic SIR model and you explain of how, yeah, how you need to write down basic equations, for example, or how you can do basic extensions of the model. So. Yes, but yeah, interesting because as you said, you are open to explain. Maybe when I decide to do this course on the SI model, I can call you to make a possible collaboration. Mm -hmm. so, so there is here another comment, uh, a very informative talk, complete vaccine effectiveness. I, be, I believe what was nice about your talk in this uh, Amit Shama, he, I believe I agree with him because was, most of the talk I saw so far did not go into vaccination, such as I asked one question to Viola from recently, it's on the channel, I post her talk and her answer. And uh, she didn't take account the vaccine, but she explained one thing interesting that you, you've seen that you, you somehow solved, not completely, because uh, the vaccine of your model is a Pfizer, I remember well. She explained that some vaccine protect against the virus, but not, but not protect against uh, spreading. Uh, I didn't say, maybe you can talk a little about, the, I didn't say your model took into account the spreading or just the vaccination, because some vaccine protect against just the virus, or the vaccine protect against the, 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 the spreading, yeah. according to Viola. Her last name is a little bit complex. I do not remember her last name. <laughs> No? What? Prisman? The Ola Prisman? Yes, I think so. Uh, uh, there is a very short... No, I'm going to uh, explain this. Uh, can you see the slides now? Let me share again. Sorry. Now you can. Um, so I will go back to this uh, model. So indeed, uh, first of all, there are various vaccines that have been approved, at least in, in Europe. And um, these vaccines are, for example, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, uh, Janssen, I think there are four, right, that have been approved. And they are different vaccines. And what we know uh, from at least from the first information that you get about vaccines, it comes from clinical trials. And in the first clinical trials, what was evaluated, uh, it was um, uh, like evaluating what is the rate uh, with which people would be hospitalized, hospitalized after vaccination. So you only look at the uh, vaccine efficacy against severe disease, hospitalization and death, for example. And that efficacy is always very, very high. So it's like 90% uh, up, 95%. So if you're vaccinated, it's very low chance actually that you will uh, die from, uh, uh, from COVID or also very low chance that you will be hospitalized. The next question was, and uh, the next question was, is, um, what is the chance that you get infected against uh, uh, after, you know, after being vaccinated? And that chance is much higher, actually. The first clinical trials, they didn't measure it exactly, but the data started to uh, come uh, a bit later, also from the uh, so-called real-world studies. So uh, if you look in our model, for example, we have this vaccine efficacy against susceptibility. Um, so it's uh, the rate at which people susceptible get uh, uh, go to the latent class is beta times lambda, and lambda this is the uh, force of infection, and beta is the susceptibility 
of individuals, which is age-dependent susceptibility, and so here is reduced. So if the vaccine efficacy would be 100%, for example, imagine, so this all this term is zero, so what happens is that your people, the susceptible people who are vaccinated, they would just never get uh, into the, you know, they would never progress and they would never get infected. And this uh, number is uh, quite variable. It, it has been already estimated. This it, what it means, what the, whether the vaccine prevents disease. Preventing disease, it means that from this compartment, you don't almost go here. So you can be... Uh, you can be vaccinated, you can get infected, but you never develop, you don't go into this box, you would only basically go into the RV box, which is a recovery after the mild disease. So you wouldn't be registered in this compartment. But um, uh, but uh, this number, it means uh, whether, uh, whether the, uh, whether the in, uh, vaccination actually prevents transmission because if, if the efficacy is not 100%, it means that it doesn't overall prevent transmission and infection, yeah? Because you can progress further. So in, main, in our main analysis, what we do is that we assume different values for this uh, vaccine efficacy against susceptibility and optimistic uh, values, it's uh, used in the main scenarios, it's like uh, 90%, it's very high because it actually has now been demonstrated that this is also quite high. This number is quite high. And the, the pessimistic values is something like 50% or 55%. And um, it's indeed, there is a difference in, in, uh, in how the vaccine efficacy, this VES, how it depends on the, on the type of vaccine, whether it's Pfizer or whether it's Janssen. Uh, I have not followed recently, like in the last two or three weeks, I didn't follow exactly what the measured values were or estimated values were. Because, as I said, in, in Portugal, when we were doing it, 96% of people, they were getting on the Pfizer vaccine. I think these values are probably lower for AstraZeneca vaccine. But I don't know, because it's not widely used in, uh, in, in, in Portugal. So um, the, the efficacy against transmission, it's, it's here. And the efficacy against disease is here. Sorry, efficacy against infection. Yeah. So um, I hope that's uh, a bit more clear, Georgia, to you and to. Uh, sure. For me, for me, it was okay. Uh, Ga uh, uh, Galias, uh, I does he explained that he's trying to publish a no a no linear model, and he wants to get start few. We have your email at the begin at the at the beginning, but I'll make sure to leave it. If you allow me, I can can talk later yeah. privately. But if you allow me, I can leave it on the description of the video as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. and, we, we are running out of time, so I'm, I'm just add a last comment here. It's a kind of question comment. It has to do with something that I ask myself as well when I saw your talk for the first time. Yeah. Uh, can, you, uh, can, can you please give some reference to, the, to learn parameter estimation? Because earlier uh, we use values of parameter from the literature, but now, but now our days, real data is most important for parameter estimation. I guess he's talking about the, the, the point of yeah, but yes. estimation. So this is the procedure which is called, so I know this procedure because I work on HIV and it's called, um, it was developed actually by people mainly in the UK and it's called uh, Bayesian evidence synthesis. So that's when you take a few different data sets and you try to estimate your parameters by fitting the model to various data sets. So I think if you like Google Bayesian evidence synthesis, you will find the, the references. And in, um, uh, for example, in the, uh, in the publication, so this preprints that I, I, I had, uh, I'm also citing, but I now cite my own work because uh, I use some something that I was developed before for the uh, transmission of other viruses like cytomegalovirus and so on. But if you want the general talks, it's called uh, uh, Bayesian inference or Bayesian evidence synthesis. I think what is interesting. It was, developed, actually, it was developed for HIV transmission. So. I, I, don't, I don't know if I understood properly your parameter estimation, but I think it has to do with the, 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 the big difference between the classical parameter estimation based on the square error. Is because in, in, in our case, if I understood properly, you can, at least the technique, I believe I studied technique with my PhD, but you, you remember well, you can just not estimate the parameter, you can estimate as well a curve, a kind of probability, if I, if I understood well. 
and uh, you can also find a probability curve for the parameter, not just the parameter, the value, the... the, the, the yes, you could, the and you find uh, also, uh, I don't know how you do with least squares, like I think you find like one parameter, but you have find yes. the distribution of parameters. So you, you find like what are, um, um, yeah, the distribution of the parameters, and then you can take a, uh, a range of that. So let's say those that are concentrated around the mean, or, you know, was uh, some I confidence think, intervals. I think it's based on a white noise, right? You have to assume that the, the, the error has a Gaussian. I don't remember quite well, I think so. No, I, no, 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 no. You don't have, you don't have to. No, no. that's nice. No. Because uh, no. when I try to when I try to use this 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 technique, my problem is I didn't have enough data. But if COVID is not the problem, I guess <laughs> for me, what you have is data. Because since it's, it's a statistical technique, you need a lot of data. Then at the time I need to use bootstrap and bootstrap create fake data, and uh, then I give up. But in your case, I believe for COVID, I don't think that data is a problem of COVID. I believe if COVID, what you have is data. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you also need to have good data because if your data is not good, that's also uh, quite difficult, I think. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Yes, but, um, yes. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, just uh, you know, just to close, uh, I was wondering if you could uh, maybe because uh, this channel has a kind of uh, uh, a different. Uh, I'm trying to find different way to keep this channel like uh, informing people and so on. One idea that I launched recently, I, I gave a talk to the study of science in Italy. I did a course, I created a course, online course about that called Innovative Biomathematics. So the idea is that you should not just make our models, you should all somehow make the model available, the models available. You already talked about the, that you talked with the policymakers, the reason why your talk is a bit more generic because you had to adapt your talk because it was difficult for adopt and so on. Uh, yeah. Maybe, uh, kick, uh, I don't know if you did that, I don't know if you faced this problem, but uh, did, you, did you see or did you try or maybe have some thought about how to make your model available as a platform, such as a web platform, people go there and make the simulation, then they go see the result, they, I mean, a kind of web application such as with your models. Do you think that could be a problem yeah. that is difficult? Um. Uh, the problem, I think, is time. So maximum of what I could do is that I could share everything that I have on the GitHub. So like if you want to have to see the code or how the model is actually implemented. So um, I, I, I have a, a different repository there, like a project. And then um, I shared all, all the slides and everything that actually that you can reproduce this study and you can check how it's done or you can extend, for example, uh, I think it's nice idea to also make like interactive applications and so on, but um, it takes time. So uh, for us, it was a lot of pressure to just to deliver the results because they were used in the policy making on time because you you have very short time. So I was not concerned about uh, putting it on the you know on the web. But people do, for example, if you do certain. This model is also quite complex, and you need a. Uh, um, at least maybe two software, so we use R a lot to, for the estimation procedure, but the rest of the calculations and figures I have done in Mathematica, so probably you know this. Yeah, so it's paid, it's paid. Yeah. And so. uh, I don't know how to do things, actually Mathematica also contacted me about uh, uh, making like my study available on, uh, on their uh, learning the website. Uh, website and I, I I promised them to do that but I still haven't I, I still haven't done that so I think I, it will be available where I like to have it more learning but it's uh, yeah uh, so. uh, because uh, recently I I'm, I'm launching a course about octave because I gave a course about MATLAB to the medical student of the University of Lachlan my PhD then I decided to give myself a challenge to launch a course in Octave. My, my motivation is that Octave is free. But do you think that if someone trying to maybe to adapt your code to Octave, because mathematics is a more symbolic software. So there is some stuff in mathematics that is difficult to replicate in MATLAB. So it's difficult to replicate in MATLAB, difficult to replicate in Octave. So I guess uh, if someone trying to make a platform online, they'll have this, let's say, this difficulty that they need to somehow get a license for MATLAB and so on. But uh, so so do, uh, do you think that could be a big, uh, I guess you use a toolbox, a very important toolbox for Mathematica that make difficult to make the migration to. I think you can program everything. I myself also did a lot of work in like C++ really programming. 
it just um, like you choose the software where it's uh, you know uh, you can faster do things or like, depending on the challenges. For example, I knew that mathema with Mathematica I can immediately make figures. For example, I don't need uh, another software. For example, and they, I did use I didn't use that much of the symbolic computations for this work because I, I just well. It's actually not true because I use the routine to solve differential equations, which is like I don't know what's, uh, what was the method that I used, but I use the routine to solve the differential equations. So if you would implement it in a proper programming language, then you need to implement like Runge Kuta force order or something yourself, you know, or use a, I don't know a package to do that. But you have that in, in MATLAB. Why you didn't choose MATLAB? I mean, just a question, just a kind of curiosity. Because uh, well, I actually used a lot during my PhD MATLAB. I didn't use it because uh, um, I think I could readapt some of the codes that I already had implemented in Mathematica. So, for example, um, yeah, there was a prior work that I did on COVID, you know, that before this that I presented, which was last year, even when COVID just started. So, and I did it in Mathematica. I, I don't know. It was easy. It's now actually also installed, so it, it works. It depends on what licenses I have because I always need to update. You know, I need to have the software available. So I also have the licenses for Mathematica, for example, now, but not for MATLAB. I, That's I, I work, yeah, because I work at it's a big hospital. It's a university mm. medical center. And uh, uh, not all the, you know, like uh, mathematical or engineering software is available. So... Yeah. So just it's possible to do it in in MATLAB, I think, pretty because MATLAB has routines for the ODE uh, to implement ODEs and so on. Yeah. Yeah, there's one ask about your GitHub. Yeah, I I, I I was going to ask the same question. So let me just enjoy the, the, the his question. Uh, I, was, I was going to ask about the MIT, like, which license you have like, in your MIT, Open Access, uh, because you said someone can adapt your code to web application. But the license of the code is going to create, a, let's say, a problem. Because in MIT, you can do whatever you want, as long as you do the reference. Which license you have in your GitHub? But you can yeah. always, for example, you can always branch from a no. You can always choose like the my um, yeah. I, I we can try to check what no, the license. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, uh, uh, the rule of uh, of GitHub: if you don't put any license, uh, GitHub uh, GitHub will say that the, all the right is yours, so no one can use it according to the rule of GitHub. The person can fork, they, they can fork, but they cannot say uh, use. I have uh, for the vaccination. I have a GNU General Public License version 3.0, and the same ah, for that's the. Good. That's good. The uh, GNU license, right? Wow, that's good. That, that's a perfect license. That's one of the for best. Both, so, for, for both, uh, so for both studies that I presented, both uh, packages they have. If you if you share my screen, I can show actually yes, the. Yes, 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 yes. I'm sharing screen. You can. I'm sharing screen. Uh, they are seen on screen. Uh, uh, the, only, uh, the only problem they give you license is that uh, the code is a contagious license. It means that uh, every, uh, when you use a GNU, you should must as well make your soft GNU. So it's a contagious license, they call it. It's a contagious. Okay. Yeah, so it, you have to sort of inherit. So I don't know, what did, did you share the screen or? Yes, yes, I'm sharing the screen. Yeah, so this is GitHub and then this is project which was called COVID-19 vaccination and this was about uh, uh, and this was COVID schools. So it has basic, actually this one, I, I would actually suggest maybe looking first at this COVID-19 schools, because it has, um, um, yeah, it has some overview, uh, like where it was uh, published. It was also what the data we used, for example, uh, for the seroprevalence data, the contact matrices that we used, the demographic data, etc. It has, uh, how the model inference or so this parameter inference was done and so on. So it, it, I mean, doesn't have too much information, but has basic information that is necessary. And then you have, uh, uh, for example, this in the scripts, you have the scripts that are used to estimate the model parameters actually, and these are the scripts and they are uh, coded in, uh, in R actually, as you can see. And then you have the model itself, which is the, well, the analysis of the model that's uh, not notebooks for example, school analysis. And, and for the other one, it's uh, quite similar. It's a quite similar description was the data and so on. And the data, uh, I think I even included all the figures that I'm showing and so on. So, yeah. 
So feel free to use and maybe we can talk later, at some point later, how we can... Okay. Hey guys. So, so so uh, so uh, hey guys uh, for uh, and I, I, it, it, it goes not just to my YouTube channel by America, it goes well to my tube of computer programming of web development I have two channels so I'm gonna make post part see this you have all this amazing code by Professor Gunnar Rosnova it's a GNU license, meaning that you can use it. So if you want to develop a web application, use biomathematics. I, I launched a course about biomathematics and web development. The challenge is that we as a web development, I, I'm a web developer as well, we should as well uh, use biomathematics to innovate. My, my course is called Innovative Biomathematics because you need to do web application for your codes. So see all those amazing codes by Professor Gunnar Snob, all of them uh, under the GNU license. It means that you can use it. I mean, as long yeah. as you keep your yeah. GNU as well. That's the point. That's why I'm putting it there so that people can also see and check and maybe, you know, somebody has better idea and writes to me like he has uh, some other ideas or he, I don't know, spotted something that is strange and he wants to ask me. So I, I want to share. I think also during this pandemic, it's important to share what you're doing so that people can evaluate it and, you know, think for themselves. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. But what I like the most on your, on your talk, and you repeat that again, is because you, you made a very good code on GitHub. Uh, sometimes ago, I remember, I, I remember in my PhD, I asked the code to someone, they said, I cannot send the code. In the, uh, some years ago, like three years ago, I could not get the code for no one. But in your case, <laughs> you made true. the code available. I mean, because I, 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 mean, regret, I regret that some of my uh, it was not like that you don't want to share, but I think that it was still not so open access. You know, the publications were also not open access. Many of them you just publish and then people can't read it actually because they were not, uh, they can't open them. And then they're not free, for example. And I regret very much because sometimes when I want to check something that I have done in the past, instead of going to GitHub and opening, now I have to search on my hard drives where was that, uh, you know, something some analysis that I did in the past. So, but yeah. I hope that it will change because overall, the, I think the community is changing. There is much more desire to do everything open access. And there is actually, it's a requirement in many journals nowadays, you cannot uh, submit or publish a publication if your data is not open access, they're just not going to do it. They say, well, yeah. we based it on the data that is not open to others so that people can't check it. Uh, we, are, we also cannot, uh, Publish yes, because nobody it's can you know, verify what you have done. So, so that's good. <laughs> It happened for me. I, I tried to publish a paper recently uh, in my second postdoc, and the, the review asked for the what is the GitHub? In my case, it was a, I developed the web application, the other research developed the, the computer simulation, computational biology part. My part was on GitHub, but that, their part was not GitHub. So the review asked, what is the GitHub? <laughs> so they had to put the GitHub, not well, the paper yeah. published. <laughs> Okay. So, 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 so guys, so guys, uh, just to close because Professor Gunnar has to leave. It was a wonderful talk. I'm talking about the JavaScript developers. I'm reading a book about JavaScript and artificial intelligence. It's a deep learning book. So as you can see, JavaScript can make very heavy calculations. So I believe you take the code of Professor Gunn under the, under the GNU license. It can be very easy for you to adapt. I mean, not easy, but you have to work a little bit. But you can adapt. It's GNU license. All the hard work she already did. She already published the paper. So you can make your website to make computer simulation using COVID. Yeah, maybe you can uh, make it more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> no, more because I'm not, I'm not a computer scientist. I know that sometimes, for example, yes. people can do more, like, uh, yeah, more efficient uh, code and so on. So, but uh, that would be yes, nice. <laughs> You, you, you did the hardest part. The hardest part is, is the mathematics. So now you, when you make the, the web development, just a matter of computer programming. I mean, you already have the code, you already have the theory, the paper. So you can just publish your sites and make people go there, make simulation, yeah. and the, always remember to make the reference. I mean, it's a new life, you know, but you still have to make the reference to the paper. I mean, not. I, I don't think that you still, but you should. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay, Professor Gane. So it was a wonderful talk. I mean, a very nice. People are thank here because of open section. So I mean, I'm still learning as well. I, I like three months that I'm doing uh, make live on this channel. This channel was a little bit just about the webinars, uh, but now I'm still doing lives. Uh, remember, the next one is if Alexei. 
uh, he'll be talking about the virtual human, and I think it's connected to the, the talk of Ghana, because Ghana did a kind of modeling specifically for the COVID. But the virtual human has to do if you make mathematical model for the whole body. Imagine if you could have a virtual pancreas, a virtual liver. All of these are going to discuss with you, Alexei. And the, Ghana, you are invited as well to go, to come here. I know that you know Alexei because you are in the same like, in the uh, network. Somehow you know him. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. so thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much. It was very nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>